And welcome to <coughs> the Ascend the Hill Challenge Day 1. Guys, we're glad you joined us here on Facebook. We have been excited for this for a long time. Let us know where you're coming from. Let us know um, where, you're, where you're attending from. If you're here live, I know some people will be watching this by replay, so we don't want you to miss out on the interaction. Put in the, put in the chat, replay. I'm watching this by replay. I'm fired up. So today, day one of this challenge, what we want to do is we want to help you in this week to develop your new season, to discover out of this time of disruption, out of delay, and maybe even disappointment and death, how God resurrects things and uh, the process of how we bounce back. And today is going to be an exciting day because we're going to talk about the topic of resilience. And we have uh, Dr. Mark Sharona with us who just wrote a book called On the Edge of Hope. So if you're here, put in the chat. If you're ready for a bounce back, say, I'm ready for a bounce back. That means that's actually admitting like, wow, I actually lost something. I actually hit the ground, you know, and I, I literally hit the ground in 2020 in a motorcycle accident. So I know what it is to bounce back. I know it takes time. I'm still bouncing back. And so we're going to talk about that today. But as you uh, put in the chat, let people know in the, on the Facebook live page that you're live or you're on the replay. Let them know you're going to bounce back. If you want to do, you know, put emojis in there. We have team members that are actually in there to help interact with you. Some people like to put fist bumps. Some people like to put fire. You do what you want to do. Uh, but we're here to encourage you this week because uh, I really believe that the greatest places for us to create the new thing are in the face of darkness. In the beginning, God's spirit hovered over the face of the deep and the face of the deep was darkness, chaos, and emptiness. And, and that's the face of, of the earth today. It looks like darkness, chaos, and emptiness. But when we know that the spirit of God is hovering over the face of darkness, he, his face actually comes into contact with the face of darkness and chaos and transforms it into his image and likeness. So if you feel like your life is in a place where you just see the face of darkness, I invite you this week and especially tonight to see the face of the logos of the word of God, of Jesus, the creator, the one whose face hovered over the face of the deep and let him transform your life into his image. And I believe that's what's going to happen this week as we discover how we enter into a new season, how God creates something new out of chaos, how he develops our destiny out of darkness, and how he gives us vision in those dark places. So um, I just want to welcome Dr. Mark Sharona. Mark, thanks for being here with us tonight. Hey, Bob, it's great to be with you and with all the family that is part of what you're doing. Yeah, we're super excited. We have a great online community. Ascend Academy is our online community. And we have been actually we just finished an eight week series um, called Momentum, developing prophetic momentum and taking the promises of God and trying to um, bring greater momentum into our life so we can advance in the kingdom of God. Uh, Mark, I was just reading um, your book uh, on the edge of hope. And uh, first of all, thank you for writing it. It's very powerful. Um, and you talked about a number of things that I've been exploring over the last uh, couple years, actually. And one of them is the topic of resilience. And I want to give sort of my layman's definition of how I came to that. And I'm going to ask you a couple questions about this topic of resilience. because I think it's, it's a very important topic for now. But I was going through a time at the end of 2019 where I was experiencing some things that, that really had me in a, at a low place. And I asked the Lord about this, and I felt like it, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. I'm teaching you resilience. And I, I really wasn't sure what the word meant. Uh, I asked a coach of mine in my life at the time, and she said, well, resilience emotionally is the, is the ability to not be affected by things outside of you so that things inside of you are greater than what's around you. And that reminded me a lot about the scripture about Christ in us. Uh, it reminded me about how that it's the wit manifold wisdom of God that is made manifest to the world through the church and how what's inside of us needs to be greater than what's around us. And then it led me to the topic of bouncing back because when what's inside is greater than what's around, 
it gives us the ability to bounce back. And that's a, that's a layman's definition, but that's sort of been my working definition for the topic of resilience is that when I'm stronger on the inside, it gives me the ability to bounce back uh, against what's on the outside. I'm interested in how you would define resilience and why you think it would be an important thing for us to develop in the times in which we live. Okay, so let me let me back into that for just a, a brief moment, if I can. Resilience, from a, given given my propensity for psychology, I've got, as you know, a graduate degree in psychology, and I I'm a I'm a hobbyist when it comes to psychology because as a pastor and um, someone who is involved in the spiritual formation of people, spending so far 48 years in the people helping business has really caused me to want to learn how to integrate the best of psychology and its wisdom with the best of orthodox theology. Um, And that practice, by the way, as we've talked about before, goes back a long, long way. It goes back to the ancient fathers of the church, um, where the the, the matters of the soul, the psyche, um, have to be understood and honed and embraced, and those capacities have to be realized or can be by the promises of God. And so, Resilience is an aspect of research in the current culture that's been done in the field of positive psychology, which is a relatively new field in psychology um, post-World War II. Post-World War II, um, as we move towards the 1960s, Dr. Howard Seligman began to explore what are the things that we do right as human beings. And that became the beginnings uh, at the University of Pennsylvania of the field of positive psychology. And resilience was a big part and is a big part of the research done in the world of positive psychology. We're so used to, um, and, and in many ways, rightfully so, we're used to looking at what's wrong with the human race, what's wrong with the human condition. Obviously, We're sinners saved by grace. And so there is an emphasis we've got to realistically look at. Lord Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. So there is that. But there's also the things we get right. And positive psychology wants to focus on the things we get right. And resilience is a trait that if you operate in it, you're getting it right. Because resilience is actually revealed in your level of embodying your ability to respond healthily to any disruption of any sort. Now, we tend to think of the big three in terms of disruptions as disappointment, defeat, and failure. And so the question becomes, do we allow those things to keep us in a down state when we face disappointment, defeat, or failure? Or do we know how to quickly get back up and keep moving forward? So the American Psychological Association um, has accepted how positive psychology looks at resilience. And this is the definition. Resilience is that ineffable quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever, rather than letting failure overcome them and drain their resolve They find a way to rise from the ashes. And then in a nutshell, what you said, resilience can be defined as the ability and the tendency to bounce back. Now, what's interesting with that is that adaptive resilience is about more than bouncing back. It's about bouncing beyond. Wow. Can you stop right there? Hold on just a second. Uh, We did have a little technical glitch. So I want to welcome some people that just came on uh, on Facebook Live. But you guys heard the definition. Um... And it's the ability and it's the the ability that some people have to not just bounce back, to bounce higher. So welcome to the uh, Ascend the uh, Ascend the Hill Challenge day one. And we're bouncing back. Apparently they had a little back behind the scenes technology and you guys just got on. But we're talking about resilience, why it's important and why we need it, okay? And, and uh, Dr. Mark Sharona just uh, called it the ability to bounce back. But I want to catch you up a little bit because this is really an important season that we're in because 
as he just defined delays, disappointments, even death. Those are things that we all experience in life, but the ability to bounce back from those things is what we want to talk about because creating a new season out of that um, is very important. So I want us to pick up on, on that and the, particularly what you said about some people having the ability to do this. And then the second thing you said was not just bounce back, but to bounce back higher. So could you share maybe some of the characters? Yeah, okay. So, so just, I, I didn't say some people, all of okay. us have resilience as a trait. Some have okay. it developed more effectively than others. We, we all have resilience. Some people naturally express it more easily than others. But the good news is, is that all of us can improve our resilience. Okay. But then within the field of positive psychology, while resilience is the study of bouncing back, more recent research keys in on what they now call adaptive resilience, which is the ability not just to bounce back, but to bounce beyond. Okay. And, and so what, what would you say are the characteristics of a person? Have they identified, like, what, what are the things that make us more resilient? Okay, so there are um, six major areas. Number one, there's causal analysis. Causal analysis is our ability to comprehensively and accurately identify the causes of a problem. How well do we identify, how accurately do we identify the causes of a specific problem that we're facing? And our inability to do that will have a profound effect on whether we bounce back or not. So now we've broken that down into one of the six areas. And instead of just saying, oh, oh great, I give up. Well, maybe now I need to stay, take a step back instead of overgeneralizing and say, this is the worst thing that happened in my life. Do I really understand what the problem is that I just hit that was pushed back instead of pushed forward? So causal analysis. And then there's Albert Bandura's work in his life called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is our sense of capability and confidence in the world. And again, all of us have some sort of a self-efficacy quotient, but it can be strengthened. All of these things can be strengthened. So all of us can develop a greater sense of capability and confidence about how we are in the world we live in. Got it. And obviously the promises of God are given to us for, for uh, in many ways, how to live a life that is abundant. And so these are not insurmountable odds that we're facing. These are all within the realm of what human possibility promises in, in the nature of what God created us to be and to become. Then the third area is realistic optimism. Now, each of these could be a book all by itself, as you know, but we're giving the highlights tonight. So realistic optimism is the belief that things can change for the better and that I have a certain amount of control over hmm. many of those things. Now, I am not in control. God is. I mean, in the sense that God is sovereign. And there's a lot of things that are beyond my control. But within the realm of what is in my control, a realistic optimist holds to the confidence and the belief that he or she can change for the better and they can manage those things that are under their control. And then another, another one of the six is empathy. Empathy is one of the six characteristics of, um, of um, resilience. And it's the ability to read others' cues um, to understand their emotional state. So this is relational because the truth is none of us lives to ourselves. None of us dies to ourselves. So <clears throat> if I'm not an island and I can't know myself by myself, empathy becomes really important. If I, two are better than one, if one falls, the other can pick him up. So part of resilience, Bob, is how you help me walk through what I'm going through and how I can relate to you or you relate to me in my pain so that uh, if if you're in pain, I can come alongside you and and help you walk through it. And then there's reaching out. And that's the ability to seek out new opportunities and challenges and even relationships. And then there's two more. There's 
there's the, the, the one big one. Here's the big one. You ready? Yeah. Emotional self-regulation. <laughs> That's, what That's we got to do with, with the, <laughs> yeah, the full gamut of our negative emotions, mostly, and how we move them towards the positive spectrum. And emotional self-regulation, if you sum it all up, and again, that's a book all by itself. I touch on it a little bit in my, my book on um, yes. the edge of hope. But yep. it's the ability to stay calm under pressure. And I didn't learn that until I was under so much pressure that I wasn't calm. And yeah, I was no, and, and, you, and you talk about this in your book. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an avid note taker. Anytime we talk, I'm taking notes. But even here, we're online and I'm still taking notes. So, and, I, and, I, and I love the bullet point. And because I'm a preacher, I, I love to alliterate, which is sometimes not a good thing. But... You know, you wrote some things down, causal analysis, and you talked about, you know, understanding why it happened. And I, and I want to use the word curiosity there. Do you think that developing curiosity is helpful in understanding the causal analysis of something? Yeah. T today, curiosity means something different than it would have meant 200 years ago. 200 years ago in the, in the Western culture, curiosity up until then was considered a very negative thing and it was all bad news it was all focused on unhealthy things but today curiosity the way we understand curiosity this is so important i'm glad you brought it up because curiosity is one of those words that is tied to lifelong learning and becoming a lifelong learner which is another way of saying a disciple um and so the highest state you can be in in order to grow and learn is curiosity. So Love if it. we can stay curious, we can learn. Yes. If I'm open to learning, I'm open because I'm curious about what I don't know. So if I can look at a problem and instead of saying this defeated me, say, while this may have defeated me, this presented a challenge I've never faced before. What is it I'm missing? Then you got to become like Sherlock Holmes and just start looking for the obvious in the places you weren't looking and observe in a curious way so that you can go back and say, well, wait a minute, what did I learn from this setback? This setback is actually a, a promise of a comeback if I can learn to be curious. Yes, I love this. And this is, anyone that's in our community knows that I have a saying, curiosity is the precursor to revelation. And I know that word's overused, but I go back to Matthew 16 and Jesus, revealing to the disciples through the father that he's the Christ. And he, and he started that conversation with questions. Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I think that's an example. Would you say that that's an example of being curious? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, you know, years ago, um, as a kid, I asked a thousand and one questions. And at some point, I don't remember where it was, but some adult said to me, stop asking so many questions, kid. And it, it, it had an impact. I, and I wanted their approval more than I wanted to grow. Yes. And I shut that down. And I went through a crisis in the 1990s where God revisited that pain that had frozen me emotionally and unlocked that. And I learned how to become curious again at, at an age where things began to accelerate for me. Um, that's from, that's where the book, when we talk about synchronicity, the inner path comes yeah. from. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, and honestly, like I, I'm this, I was the same kid. Stop asking questions. Stop asking where we're going next. What are we going to do? I think, I think curiosity is a key to the sort of prophetic nature that we have and, and reigniting that childlike curiosity. We could talk about this actually for hours, just this topic, but I want to take a moment to um, help people to focus on like one of these topics and maybe to develop some curiosity about the rest of the things you said, because we are going to have a time uh, after this where people can come to a, a, a Q and a session where we'll be able to unwrap these sure. things a little bit more. So I think like you talked about self-efficacy, which, you know, you kind of described as confidence. That's probably too, too generalized um, of, a, of a statement for it. You talked about realistic optimism, which could be called hope or even creativity uh, there. Empathy, which you described as 
I thought I felt companionship and compassion kind of played there and then reaching out for community and then emotional self-regulation, which is control. I, I, I had to alliterate those, but those six points, if, if you guys can just pick up on one of those and use curiosity to start to ask questions about those things and to grow in those things, because these are the elements of having a bounce back uh, and elements of resilience. Um, what a, What's one of those other topics in there that you felt like you personally uh, found that you needed to develop more and how did you do it? You're talking to me personally or to the game? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. How, which, which one of these um, self-efficacy, realistic optimism, empathy, reaching out, emotional self-regulation, I mean, which one of those did you have to really be intentional about developing and how, how did I, you... for, for me, I wrote the book on dysfunction. So I had to, I had to, be, I had to be intentional about all of it. Regulation, <laughs> but right? If, if, but if, Italian, we with, if, we, if we start with, if we start with, if we start with emotion, regular, emotional self-regulation. Yeah, that's me too. Um, <laughs> you know, that's all about identifying your thoughts and your behaviors when emotions are less than optimal. Yeah. And you have to learn how to think on your feet without stepping on anybody's toes and learn how to process your frustrations and your anger without dumping them on people. Um, and look, I, I still fail miserably at this, but I look at where I am today. I don't want to tell you how old I am and how long I want to give anybody this. You know, it took Abraham a long time to have Isaac. Let's just put it that way. So this this stuff doesn't change us overnight. We go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. But this curiosity piece is important because it's, again, in psychology, it would be tied to the difference between what Carol Dweck calls a fixed mindset as opposed to a growth mindset. Hmm. People that develop a, a paradigm, a mindset of growth, are instinctively or cultivate the instinct of being curious. Mm -hmm. and so if I can learn to be curious, like instead of like if anger shows up immediately, you know, I'm an Italian, you know, I, I've got a vendetta spirit, as Cindy Jacob says, you know, I go after it or I take a step back. I realize I am not these negative thoughts. I am not these negative feelings. I am having them mm -hmm. and become curious and say, well, how come these are there? Interestingly enough, what I learned with this, Bob, was that years ago when I first started doing this, I discovered oftentimes my anger when I took a step back and said, what am I afraid of? The anger was really a mask for fear. Yeah. I, I, the anger is oftentimes a secondary emotion underlying a more stronger fear that's hiding behind the anger because I'm threatened in some way. What is threatening mm -hmm. me? And so, so, you know, I mean, listen, I can go through all six, but I would say, yeah from from a from a perspective of what's going on right now in the culture and everything we've had to face in the last three years between covid and the major disruptions that it created <clears throat> a collective way in which it disturbed our peace i think emotional self-regulation is a really big one right it's huge now. yeah and with that realistic optimism because i think we think to be an optimist you have to always think positive the truth is a genuine realistic optimist embraces their negative thoughts they don't ignore them or deny them as a matter of fact all of us have negative thoughts 70 percent of the time so if optimism requires that you never have a negative thought the whole human race is disqualified because they've proven that 70 percent of our emotions and thoughts are negative and and we have to learn how to identify the thoughts that trigger the feelings and the emotions and learn how to make those shifts so again that's part of emotional self-regulation because our cognitions and our affections are intimately tied together. Yes, and 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 actually, the role of curiosity and that empathy, self empathy, compassion, is really what helps us to ask those questions of ourselves. Why am I angry? Which led you to to fear, which could cause an aggressive anger. But there's also a shame, absolutely uh, based anger that could cause us to withdraw. 
Right. Uh, and I and I was actually conversing with myself about this particular issue. And this is something I dealt with when I was a, a child too, and is tracked with me. And I decided instead of pairing anger with fear that makes it aggressive or shame that makes it withdraw, just pair it with wisdom that gives it a voice, you know, because anger has a purpose. It, it, it exposes injustice. It helps us to say, I'm not going to stay the way that I am, or life is not the way it should be right now. I'm going to do something about that. I mean, do you find that you use your anger in a way that is um, constructive? Um, I have learned how to more effectively use my anger in a constructive way. These days, what I will often do when I am angry, if I'm self-aware enough and not just in a in an in Italian New York mode, not over caffeinated and in, 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 in a <laughs> sanctified state um, uh, where I'm self-aware and God aware, right. when anger is triggered in me by a conversation where someone is saying something, I'll take a step back. And I'll form a question that will help me get clarity so that I don't make premature judgments or that I don't allow my own filters to have misheard what was actually being said. Because sometimes what I think you said and what I mean, what I think you mean is different than what you said and what you mean. So I'm not reacting to you. I'm still reacting to my own psychological unfinished business. And if I love you, I have to be able, if I really love you, I'm going to relate to you in a non-judgmental way. And the only way I can stay calm with you is not to judge you, which means I've got to deal with my negative emotions and my anger and realize, no, I'm dealing with my brother, Bob. We both love Jesus. So he just said something that triggered anger in me. But he's not the root of my anger. and He's not the cause of my anger. What is it that that triggered that he may not even be conscious of? And that's all that all goes through me r rapidly now. It didn't go through. I had to, you know, it's like driving a stick shift car. Remember the I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I remember when you learned how to drive a stick shift car. Well, I mean, you drive a, mo you have a motorcycle. I mean, it's, there's a learning curve. My dad taught me how to drive on a stick shift. You want to know about anger? Yeah. So so I mean, <laughs> learning how to depress the clutch and then put on the gas and then lift up the clutch and make the shift. Yes. I mean, I gave my best friend backlash, whiplash, every kind of lash because we borrowed his Volkswagen for me to turn learn how to drive. And it was, uh, it was today I can sit in a stick shift car and do it without thinking and drink a soda. And now don't ask me how I drink a soda with one hand on the wheel and one hand on the shift. But the fact is when I first was working with in a more conscious way, emotional self-regulation, it was a learning curve. It was a skill that had to be developed. I wasn't competent at it. And I had to be patient enough to realize these skills take time to develop. Be patient with yourself. Um, and so today, I think I'm better at it. I don't always know that I get it right now. But I'm, I'm, it's more of a deeply embedded pattern than the other was. And so I'm grateful for that because there I do see progress and I do see change. Yes. And and I want to I want to bring this around because we're we're almost at the end of this part of the conversation. And uh, we want to invite you guys. We're going to continue this conversation that he's just my curiosity is off the chart. So he's created a lot of questions in me and hopefully for you. And we have a group of people that are here on Zoom that will stay for this bonus Q&A. And if you wanna be part of the Q&A, uh, they'll put a link in there, you can be part of it. And the reason we've done it this way is we have different speakers each night and we wanna be able to bless them and we wanna be able to, to, to honor them financially. So there is a small charge for that. Um, if you want to be part of that, you'll get a, a recording of that so you can register for that. We're going to move to that in just a few minutes. But this um, conversation about resilience and, and curiosity, all these things, I, we, I could talk for hours. I love to learn about this, but it reminds me and it brings me back to Christ in you is the hope of glory and that these are all things that we're becoming wholly human, fully whole spiritual beings. Um, but what part of this resilience is actually the, the image of God being formed in us? Do you see it that way? 
Well, if we think about, you know, the ultimate example of resilience, it's Christ. If, and if we think about the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow, what greater resilience is there than the resurrection itself and the ascension to the right hand of the Father? Um, there were many moments. Let's just now, now, obviously, when we talk about Jesus, you know, this is the God man. So there are certain things we think we can do like Jesus, which are going to take us forever to get there because the promises are so that we can become partakers right. of the divine nature. So Christ in me today has more leeway than Christ in me when I was 19 because I've gradually given more and more of my will to be formed, my psyche to be shaped, my heart to be poised. But think about Jesus knowing what awaits him at the cross long before he gets there. And yet, even at the Last Supper, he's calm. He's even joyous and sings a hymn and is fully present to those 12 disciples. So much so that when Peter and John <clears throat> prepared for the the meal in the upper room, which is John Mark's mother's house. Um, Luke doesn't tell us all those details, but you fill them in with what you what we know about history and who John Mark was, who I was named after, by the way. Um, and um, they go to prepare the meal. They follow a man carrying a water jar up to this large, thoroughly furnished upper room. Well, that's an anomaly because men don't carry water jars in the ancient Near East. Women do. So Jesus in, is inviting them to not give up and quit because they see an anom anomaly, but to keep going. That's just that alone is resilience. But that yeah. little, that, that man carrying the water jar, the historians tell us is more than likely John Mark, the kid who, whose mother owned the house and he leaves the water jar there. They do everything to prepare the meal except hire a servant to wash their feet. So the water jar is outside that door for ceremonial cleansing, but none of the disciples decide, well, there isn't a servant here. Let's wash our feet ourselves or wash one another's feet. So they walk in and sit down and don't say nothing. They all go by, they, they clear their throat and go and sit down. And then Jesus, when they're all seated, gets up, takes off his robe, dons the servant's towel. Now, mind you, this, he's, he's going to suffer the most cruel form of torture known in history, the Roman crucifixion. There's not, there's not one sense of anxiety or unrest. You talk about emotional self-regulation, he is totally at peace. He's not acting in one way and de delaying anything in that sense. He washes their feet in love. He eats the meal, he, 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 he ordains the Eucharist. And he crosses over the Kidron Valley, singing Psalm 118, the great Hallel, which has so much spiritual significance about victory and joy. Bind, my, bind me to the festival altar, which is him being bound to the cross. And he gets to Gethsemane. And now all of a sudden he enables, he allows all of that pain to start affecting him. He waits until that moment. And he begins to redeem us because the agony and the stress is so great that the capillaries at the surface of his skin burst and he begins to sweat drops of blood. So his redemption doesn't begin at the cross. It begins when he sheds his blood in the garden. Mm. And, and yet he's able to not have to deal with that until that moment. You and I aren't there. I had an appointment with a doctor today and I was anxious before I got there. I was anxious all night thinking about it because I knew what he wanted to talk about. And I just didn't want, you know, get go. Anyway, just me and doctors have a relationship and it's not the most positive. So you weren't singing the hell out, I'm huh? talking about emotional self-regulation right now. And it didn't work well for me <laughs> when it comes to anxiety today because of some concerns I have about, um, you know, when doctors look at your eyes, it's just, it's, it was an eye surgeon. And so, um, you know, and, and it went fine, but you know, it was, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. And so I had to manage my anxiety, but, but I promise you, 
there are ways we can learn to partake of the divine nature where we learn how to, with those deeply embedded negative emotions, coexist with them without them defining us. And that I talk about in the book On the Edge of Hope yeah, as well. Yeah. So I had to learn, I've had to learn, and uh, Italians were born anxious. They were born worriers. And, <laughs> and, and, and so I've had to learn how to live with anxiety and be with it without allowing it to define me or overpower me. Amen. That, has, that hasn't always been easy. Amen. And remember, the two people <clears throat> we take our cues from in the scripture on anxiety are Jesus and Paul. And they say the same thing, be anxious for nothing. But we end up thinking, well, we just, just throw it out. Well, the man who said be anxious for nothing, I just told you, experienced staggering anxiety and trauma in, and collapsed under the weight of it in Gethsemane. Right. Those are the words in the Greek. And yeah. Paul, who says be anxious for nothing, is the guy who said to the Corinthian church, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And then he goes on to say, and I despaired of life. So those yeah. are strong negative That's emotions. So he's, not so giving us, he's not giving us, well, you can just shake this off. He's letting us know. There's a process you go through for emotional self-regulation, and it takes time to become a partaker of the divine nature. Man, it takes time. That, there you go right there. And if you are, are watching on Facebook Live, maybe you're even watching by replay, uh, why don't you put in the chat one of your takeaways? And there are people here live on Zoom that are putting in there. You know, resilience isn't just the ability to bounce back, but to bounce beyond. I love that one. And that um, when, we, when we we're able to develop a curiosity or a, a, an ability to have causal analysis that we'll be able to discern what we're supposed to learn. And curiosity is, a, is what's needed for lifelong learning. Um, if you guys want to learn more about this topic, please go uh, to Dr. Shrona's website, markshrona.com, or go to Amazon, buy his book, On the Edge of Hope. It's filled with wisdom like this, um, but I love this. And we're going to continue this conversation. In fact, maybe there was one takeaway that you had that you're curious about. And if you want to ask a question about that, we want to invite you to join us for a separate Q&A right after this session. In just a minute, uh, we're going to bring on one of our online community members, um, a couple that's been part of our online community for over three years that had a setback that became a bounce back, but are still learning how to develop resilience in that. And I want to, um, Zach and Madison Brinson are going to come on in just a minute and share a testimony. But uh, would you guys give, do me a favor, give a shout out to Mark Sharona, give an emoji, give a fire, give a fist bump, go follow him on, on Instagram or Facebook and get his book. And if you want to join us, they're going to put the link uh, in the chat so that you can join us for this Q&A that's coming right up. But as you get prepared to do that, um, we're just going to um, thank Mark, Mark Sharona for being with us, and he's going to stay with us. But those of you who joined us on Facebook and you have, you have to go, we just want to bless you. Um, Mark, would you just close in a prayer for those that are listening to develop sure. resilience? Sure. Father, I thank you that you love us with an everlasting love, and you so express that love through Jesus that he is the quintessential lover of our souls. And that even now by your Holy Spirit, that love is being poured into our hearts endlessly, ceaselessly, unquestioningly, so that we can become whole and move into places of flourishing and abundance. I pray that you would rekindle within us that childlikeness that's always willing to be curious and learn. And so cause us by your spirit to bear the fruit of love and joy and peace and that component of self-control that is emotional self-regulation. Father, we believe you not only are a good God, but that you're up to something good, not just out there in creation elsewhere, but right here in us. Remind your sons and daughters, my brothers and sisters, 
that always, Father, underneath us are the everlasting arms of your Son and your Spirit. So no matter how deep we feel we have touched a bottom, your Son and Spirit are deeper still, catching us up into your never-ending love. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 And we are going to just share a, a quick testimony from one of our community members right now. Um, Zach and Madison Brinson um, are dear friends of mine. Um, they're like family members to me. Um, they call me Uncle Bob for their son, and there's a reason behind that. Um, guys, thanks for coming on, and, and thanks for sharing your testimony. How are you doing tonight? We're doing great. great. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, we love this topic of resilience. In just a moment, we're going to end this um, first night of this challenge. I want to invite you guys to come back tomorrow night. We have David Wagner. We're going to talk about overcoming disappointment and how to develop um, a sense of destiny out of that disappointment. But you guys have had some disappointment that you experienced uh, in your lives. Um, and we met and you became part of that, our community, because you did have a bounce back, maybe even a bounce beyond. Uh, can you can you guys just tell us about that, how we met and, and the impact of this community on you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So we were at a conference in California that you were speaking at. And when the conference was over, someone invited us up to meet you. And so we just had a few uh, just very simple get to know you, you know, exchange names where we're from. And you asked if you could pray for us. And he said many amazing things. But in the middle of that, um, one of the things that you began to talk about is you began to talk to Madison and share with her a word about how uh, there's been some delay and disappointments over her life and that uh, she's meant to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And you said, what's tied up inside of you, I untie in the name of Jesus. And having absolutely no idea, you didn't know that we were uh, dealt with several miscarriages over the last several years. And within two months, we were pregnant. And nine months after that, we had a child. And that's one of my favorite stories. I, say, I like to say God loves babies, right? And <laughs> um, he does. He loves to birth new things. And, and I think there's hardly a disappointment um, that's harder than when you're trying to conceive, uh, and especially when you have loss. And um, Madison, can you just share, I know you wrote actually a little a book about this. Um, can you share one of the things that you've learned about this um, process of overcoming this disappointment? Yeah, I think for me, um, two things really that the Lord just brought me back to after each one of our miscarriages and the, the lengthy amount of time that was in between all of the pregnancy. <clears throat> Carrie, and then it would be almost a year before we would conceive again. And it just felt like such a long waiting process. And one of the things that the Lord quickly taught me was sometimes what we, um, what we feel like is a promise going unfulfilled is actually him just choosing to bring a promise to pass in a way that doesn't match up with our expectation of how we thought he would. And so for me, it was just a matter of learning to surrender the expectation that I have of what I thought it would look like and yield myself to however he wanted to bring the promise about, because I trust that he is always good. He is always faithful and he will never make me a promise that he's not going to fulfill. So even if it is confusing to me and it doesn't make sense as to why our path is working out the way that it is, I just know that if the promise hasn't been fulfilled yet, he's just still working. Um, so surrendering expectations was a big one. And then the second one is just learning to prioritize finding Jesus in the middle of the waiting and not just waiting for the outcome um, and, and learning to meet with him. And honestly, some of the most precious ways, the intimacy that I found with the Lord in the, that heavy, long, disappointing season um, is a treasure to me. It was one of the greatest treasures I got from that season. So those are the two biggies for me. Yes. And I really appreciate you sharing this guys, um, because I also know that um, you guys had another promise that, that looked like it was going to come to pass. In fact, we were together in May and I, and I had a sense that maybe it was time for another one. And you guys said, yeah, we were thinking about it. Um, and then you did share with me, you know, not long after that, you became pregnant again. And just uh, about a month ago, um, you had a disappointment, right? You, you, you lost 
that child. Can you can you tell me because we spoke since, but can you tell me how you feel now um, compared to that feeling of seeing a promise fulfilled and then seeing a promise delayed? What what have you learned now, Madison? Um, you know, I'll be fully honest. It was a little shocking. I wasn't expecting to have to go through that again. Um, so it, it surprised us for sure. But the thing that the Lord was so kind to do is everything that he had built up in us in those years of waiting, they were there firm. And so when we had this disappointment come again, and honestly, it was worse in a lot of ways, it was worse this time than any of the other ones that we had had from a physical standpoint and an emotional standpoint. Um, all of those tools and, and treasures that he gave me in those years that we were working through it the first time, they stood firm and held strong and that anchor held. And so just going back to the basics of Jesus, this does not make sense to me. And it's not my job to have an answer. Be curious, investigate everything you can ask him why. And if you don't get an answer, don't get hung up on it and trust again, trusting that he is still working all things together for good. Um, and I love, I think Chris Ballatin says this, if it's not good yet, he's not finished and yeah. he's working behind the scenes. And I choose to trust that above the heaviness or the disappointment, not that those things don't exist, but he is greater than those things and his faithfulness is greater. Amen. Thank you for your bravery to share that with us. Thank you for allowing us into that space. And I, and I, it was hard on me to see you guys go through it too. And um, this community is with you. And I love what you said, that the lessons that you learned in previous disappointments actually helped you for what you're going through. And I, and I want you guys to hear that, that actually there's some things that you may not expect that will happen. But if you're in him, in Christ, you're actually more prepared than you think you are. And so um, we'd love to just invite you to, if you want to stay with us and come on uh, to this Q&A session. But if this, if this is where we part, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for allowing us to share with you some of our journey and the wisdom that, of the people around us. Um, this is a community that we believe in growth, uh, in hearing God's voice, growth in developing our voice will actually lead us to help us to discover our place in the culture. And I was pleased to share with you uh, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mark Sharona, and some very close friends of mine in our online community. So I hope you guys uh, can join us again tomorrow. I'm going to let you go on Facebook. And if you guys want to join us here on live, we're going to continue the discussion just for a few minutes here. So um, God bless you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow night.